Awesome. Hey, this is Troy Taylor with the Championship Football Coaches Clinic podcast. I have Coach Gene Chizik on today. So excited to have Coach on. Coach, uh, I, I would say most people know who you are, um, but could you just uh, introduce yourself to the clinic and, and tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah, Troy, I will. So I, I, the, my name is Gene Chizik, guys. Uh, I'm the defensive coordinator here at the University of North Carolina. Um, the Cliff Notes version is uh, born and raised in Florida. Uh, my, my father was a high school football coach and then became a high school principal. Um, so I was football's always been my first love. I remember sitting back and watching all the days of the Green Bay Packers and Minnesota Vikings when they didn't have domes and they're breathing the smoke and all that stuff sitting on my dad's lap and watching TV on Sundays. That's where I fell in love with football. And, um, you know, so it's always been a huge part of my life. But as I grew up, um, Played football my whole life, uh, played in Florida, went to the University of Florida, played there, um, got done playing and then went right into coaching. Actually, a lot of people don't know this, Troy, um, that I coached high school football for two and a half years, two, two full seasons uh, and another half a season. But really, really had a, a wonderful time uh, coaching high school ball. And to be honest with you, I wasn't uh, really, you know, just diehard set on on going into college at all. I was really um, very happy doing what I was doing. Uh, and then um, Danny Ford ended up giving me a uh, giving me a, an opportunity to get into college coaching back in the 80s uh, when he was the head coach at Clemson and I was able to be there uh, and they brought me on as graduate assistant. So um, been around a lot of great coaches that kind of got me started into my college career. Um, and here we are 30 something years later, uh, I'm still doing it. So, uh, I've been very blessed to be around a lot of great guys. It's really interesting and unique, um, that I'm back with Mac when we were together, uh, you know, several years back at the university of Texas. And, um, we were able to have a lot of success there. Um, got back into coaching probably because of him, uh, I was doing ESPN and had a great TV gig for, uh, several years back to back to back. And, um, and then coach called me and wanted me to come back to UNC where I had actually been a coordinator previously, but I've got a long track record of starting in high school and then, you know, working my way to several different places. And then, um, you know, ultimately ending up back here at the end of my career. Yeah. Coach, I got, uh, got people making comments here. This is my cousin, uh, Monica Gibson. She's listening from Morgantown, West Virginia. She's a big WVU fan, Coach. Um, so I never knew that your dad was a high school coach. And I had Tom McDaniels on, who's Josh and Ben McDaniels' dad. He's a 40-year high school coach in Ohio. Uh, where did your dad coach? And I, I would assume that he has probably had the biggest impact on your coaching career. Can you tell me a little bit about your dad, Coach? Yeah, Troy, uh, I, I'm very blessed because my dad was my hero, right? And it's really uh, awesome when people can say that. But my dad was a World War II Marine. Mm. Uh, my dad was actually a guy that uh, he started playing college football at a small college in Florida called Rollins College. They don't even have football anymore. But he was he was at Rollins College as a scholarship uh, football player. And then the war broke out, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And him and his best friend on the team, uh, they went enlisted uh, into the Marines. And so he fought in the Marines for four years and then came back and finished playing college ball, uh, which is pretty amazing to me. Uh, that's that's pretty much sums up why why he's my hero. But uh, he was a man's man. He was a World War II Marine, uh, played college football at Rollins for uh, four years, graduated. And then when he graduated, he literally got a um, a high school coaching job down in Miami. Wow. Uh, down in Miami. Uh, that's where he met my mother. They got married, moved up to the Clearwater area, and he started coaching at Largo High School. Some of you guys probably know where Largo High School is. They've had a lot of great players come out of there as well. Uh, and then he was he ended up being, you know, an assistant coach uh, at both Tarpon Springs High School and Largo High School, which is down in the uh, Pinellas County area in Florida. And uh, then... He had four kids. He wasn't making any money. <laughs> so he did what a lot of guys do that they're in the coaching world. Uh, he ended up getting into administration uh, and then he became a high school principal. And his he always told me 
just for you high school coaches out there, this is the kind of principle you want. He always said he was always putting a premium on making sure that he gave the football coaches everything he could give them, as many assistants as he could give them, hiring the best guy because he knew that football controlled the climate of the school. Wow. And he always told me that. He always said, if we have a great football season and we have a great uh, opening to our year, it usually translates – all the way through the rest of the year. And he's really right, right? It's It just promotes school spirit and everybody gets, uh, everybody loves winning and everybody loves, you know, coming to football games and it becomes an event. And he had, that always resonated with me. So um, he was always a guy that, you know, promoted football, loved football, introduced me to football. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very blessed to have a dad that really kind of got me started on all this. And I've loved it ever since, been doing it over 50 years. Yeah, coach. So do you think that that was an advantage having a dad who was a high school coach and educator and administrator getting into the game? I don't think there's any question. Um, he always used to tell me, and I use this in recruiting now, and I use it with players to this day. He always used to tell me, no disrespect to the English or the math teacher, they'll never have the same impact as the coach. Mm -hmm. He knew that, A, because he was a player, B, because he was a coach. So he understood what that was and he understood the responsibility that came with that because he said the impact um, that you guys have, meaning high school coaches, uh, coaches in general, whatever level, the impact you have on players is everlasting. And it's much, you can have, you can have more impact, uh, you know, in a four month period of time in one year um, than, you know, high school teachers can have the, you know, your entire four years. And um, it's, it's just, it's generational impact that you can have. So that always resonated with me, um, the importance of what a coach can be, impact a coach can have. Uh, and he also, uh, being an uh, administrator and an educator, was extremely clear when he used to tell me that everything is about how you teach. Uh, and everybody learns differently. And being an educator, you know, that resonated with me because that's very true in coaching now, right? You got a room full of 16 guys uh, from 16 different backgrounds that don't all learn the same. They don't all see it the same way. They don't all hear it the same way. How are we doing this in, in terms of how are we learning and teaching guys what you want them to do when they all learn differently? And it's a really unique, uh, you know, approach, but it's real. And it's facts. So being around a guy who loved the game, uh, who understood the importance of the game from coaching it and the impact you can have on guys and then understanding how to be the best at what you do. It is about how you say it. It is about how you teach it. It is about your approach uh, on to different guys on how they learn. And I've always kept that with me. Yes, sir. So you, you went to work. Uh for Danny Ford at Clemson and he, he won a national championship at Clemson. Correct coach. He did. What, what did you, what did you learn from him and his staff and who did you work with there coach? Yeah. I'll tell you, we had an all-star staff. Um, I guess the first college defensive coordinator I was ever around as a coach was a guy named Bill Oliver. Uh, his nickname was brother Oliver. And he was uh, at the time so far ahead of his time. He was the, uh, defensive coordinator at Alabama when they won the national championship in 1992. Um, he was our defensive coordinator, and we had probably the top defense in the country at Clemson at the time, um, just really ahead of his time, very innovative. Matter of fact, it's really interesting. When I was a GA, and just for coaching reference, um, my, my dad told me when I went to take that job to make sure you sit in the room um, and you, uh, you do a lot of listening. And he said, mm. do a lot of, do a lot of note taking. Like they don't, they don't care anything about what, you know, right. <laughs> like you're there to, you know, that was my masters in coaching, right. I got to go and sit in. And at the time I, I knew they were really good coaches. I didn't realize it. As you look back, some of them are probably the best assistant coaches uh, maybe in the history of the game, but Bill Oliver was certainly that I've pulled out my notes within the last year and looked at some of the game plans we did in 1988. And it's some of the innovative stuff that you see now that people are doing. He was doing it back then. 
Uh, so he was quite quite a bit ahead of his time. So give me uh, one thing, coach. Give, give me one thing that he that he did back then that's still good today. Well, he mixed in the three four and the four three concepts really well back and forth. And so today, you know, everybody uh, is talking about simulated pressures, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not even sure if everybody knows what that is defined, but defined it's giving the impression that you're bringing five or six players. Um, and from an offensive perspective, it looks like you're you're overloading and you're bringing more guys than you are. But in, in reality, you're dropping other guys out and it really ends up being just a four man rush. Mm-hmm. So it simulates the look of its pressure. But in the end, when you drop into coverage, it's not. It's a four man yeah. rush and you're and you're still dropping seven. So he was doing that way back then. He would do that some out of four, three. He would do that some out of three, four, because there's a lot of three, four principles built into that um, just way ahead of his time. It really gave people fits. And and I, I don't remember if we were number one in the country in defense, but we were up there because we my first year there in 1988, we won the ACC championship. Wow. Um, and in two years, the two years that I was blessed to be there around some of these coaches, um, you know, we won 20, I think 20 or 21 games in two years. So. And that was back when you played 11 and not 12 a year. So um, just really lucky to be on the front end of being with some really, really great coaches. And uh, Coach Ford taught me a lot about uh, physicality and coaching the players and being demanding and, you know, all of those things. I think he was ahead of his time in that regard, too. And he was a young coach back then, Um, but just was blessed to be around a lot of really, uh, really talented guys who were, you know, at the time, as I look back on it, really pretty far ahead of the curve. I mean, I'm so glad you said that because if you watch the Super Bowl, Coach Bagnoli, that's what he's doing. He's walking up in a six-man double-A gap and dropping out of it. I mean, University of Florida beat Jim Trestle at Ohio State in the national championship doing the same thing that you're talking about way back then. You better have an answer for max pressure, and then the quarterback thinks he's got to get rid of it quick, and somebody's dropping back in the zone. So I appreciate you saying that, Coach. Um, cause it's true. Uh, when you left Clemson coach, where did you go then? So then, um, again, talking about how lucky you are to be around good people. I, I actually, I went to the university of Tennessee as a GA for about six weeks. And then all of a sudden there, there came a, an opening at middle Tennessee state university and, uh, MTSU at the time was, uh, it was one double a, uh, this day and age FCS, if you will, yes, right? But it was a one double A school and one of the best teams in the country. And we had the number one defense in the country. So then all of a sudden I went over and I learned from a guy named Ed Bunio, who at that level was one of the best football coaches in the country at that level. I went there and learned a completely different system. Um, and we, but at that level, we had the best defense in the country. We were number one in the country there. And that was my first real opportunity to have my own room, to coach a full uh, allotment of guys and recruit. So that was my first real full time job. So I would coached high school for two, two and a half years, two seasons, uh, then spent two seasons at Clemson as a GA and then interviewed for that job and got it. And then that was the real kind of beginning of my true college coaching career where I had my own room. I got to recruit. I got to do all those things. Uh, and was blessed to be around a really, really good, talented football coach. And the guys around me were as well. And I was a young guy and I was the same thing. I was learning and taking notes and soaking it up, um, you know, and just really wanted to go there every day and learn. And probably, and I credit them for this, and I've told them this over the years, um, you know, they were probably the biggest influence on me of learning how to teach and coach and have a progression to what we're doing. We're starting at point A and we got to get to point Z. How are we doing that? How are we saying it? What's our progression? Does it make sense to the players? You lost me there, coach. Let's back up. And they would literally make you, Ed would make us take him out on the field and every position coach, he would say, all right, I just came from X, Y, and Z high school, coach me. And we would start in it. And if you weren't right, you'd back up, start it all over again. He would have us write it up tell me your progression, write it up and give it to me in the morning. We would write it up and I'd never heard of that. So Clemson was great for me because it was very scheme oriented. We had great players. Um, The schemes were great. 
this next journey, part of my journey was, okay, how do we coach? What's our progression? How do we teach it? What do we do? And I'm a big, big believer in all that. And it served me well over the years because how we say it and how we teach guys and the approach we have in our progression from A to Z, um, I've always been a big stickler on that. So um, that group of guys, and I stayed there for two years, that group of guys taught me that. And they were the best in the business at that level at that time. Completely different defensive philosophy, um, but their approach on how they did it and how they taught was amazing. Some of the best teachers I've ever been around. And Boots Donnelly was the head coach at the time, who is a Hall of Fame coach. So I got to work for Coach Ford. Then I got to work for a guy named Boots Donnelly, who to me, this to this day, uh, I still see as one of my role models and mentor. He was fantastic uh, for the game of football. What was so different about um, the scheme other than just the teaching progression? I mean, because that comes from having a, a good tradition and a good track record of success where they have what they do. And basically they coach the coaches and the coaches have to coach the D.C., make sure we're all on the same page. Then we go coach the players. But what was so different about the two schemes? Well, the one that we had at Clemson was a 4-3-3. Three, three, everything was basing out of a 3-4, and then we jumped into a 4-3. Um, a lot of um, complexity to it, right? So there was a lot of a lot of NFL principles in that system um, with rotations in the secondary and who we were dropping and who was you know in the rush, things of that nature. Then I went to Middle Tennessee. And it was completely the opposite. We had four down linemen. They were in frog stances. We called it a wide tackle six. Yeah. And uh, that's old school. Phil Elmajan's defense. Yes. And it was uh, a lot of movement up front. We were always moving one way or the other, slanting and angling. And the linebackers were fitting off of that. Um, and uh, it was very unique. Nobody we played was doing that. Uh, we played essentially two coverages almost the entire year. But yeah, three we and one? To, what was the, it, Coach? Well, the first one was literally just a, it was a three deep zone. And yeah. we were able to do different things with the high safety where we could turn it into a robber coverage and things of that nature. Um, but everything was being able to take that base roots of that, um, that cover three, if you will, uh, and be able to tweak it every week and, and make it work for everything that we were seeing. Uh, back then, we knew, obviously, when you're in that, what are the evils of the coverage? And this is what we worked on to be good uh, at, you know, uh, minimizing those those weaknesses. Um, and, you know, and so we were able to play a little bit of that and a little bit of split safety coverage. And they just they all tied in really well with the front. And there was really nothing you could do um, to that defense that they didn't have an answer for. And me as a young guy. Uh, I was just sitting there sometimes amazed. But when we look up at the end of the year, we're the number one defense in the country. So and then, you know, you, you go there and I'm going to say in my two years there, we probably won 22 or 23 games, um, went to the quarterfinals of the playoffs twice, um, was probably a touchdown away from going to the semifinals of the national championship. So but they were always really, really good on defense. So when you look at me and, and here's the part of the story I didn't tell I had those two amazing experiences with my first two college jobs. I'm a defensive guy. I end up taking a job and learning from two of the best in the business, completely di different ways to do it, but two of the best in the business that understand X, understood X's and O's. And for the high school guys, a high school coach is listening to this. What I didn't tell you is my first high school job, I went in because I played uh, for this head coach. And when I got done with college, I went straight to coaching with him and I went as a linebacker coach. I'm fresh out of college. I'm 22, 23 years old. I take my first job. I'm the linebacker coach. And he calls me in late July and he says, our coordinator um, just got out of coaching. And I said, wow, coach, holy cow. What, do, what are you going to do? Well, who are we going to hire? He goes, I've already hired him. It's you. So, yeah. I got thrown into a 5A high school as a defensive coordinator at 22 years old. And I'm being honest, I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, <laughs> I said, OK, I'm not sure I know all this coverage stuff and all this. I said, but I'm going to get them to play hard and I'm going to motivate yeah. them. And that's what we did. 
Um, and we started turning that program around. He was a new head coach, had taken a program over that was, I think, two and eight the year before, or one and nine. And I think our first year we won five games. But I got thrown in as the defensive coordinator, never called a game in my life. Obviously, I've never coached in my life. <laughs> um, and so uh, my very first high school game ever that I coached, I was the defensive coordinator calling the game. So that's how I got thrown into the fire. Um, right, wrong, or indifferent. That was my job. And I think it was two years of just really just valuable lessons left and right for me. You know, one of them was humility. You know, they put you sometimes in positions where you're not really sure you're prepared for that. Mm -hmm. You just figure out a way to do it. And but I think one of the things that that helped me was I was humble enough to uh, be able to say to my secondary coach, you got to help me with this. I, I don't know what this is. You know what I mean? He had been coaching way longer than me. Um, and he did. He was like, man, we'll put this thing together. And it was great teamwork. And it was a great learning experience for me. But my first six years of coaching was defensive coordinator at high school. Never done it before in my life. Then I go to be a GA at a place where we won 20 games in two years and an ACC championship around great coaches. Then I go and get my first real gig in college around an amazing Hall of Fame coach. Yeah, great program. Um, and great coaches. We went over 20 games the, the you know that year or those two years. So my first year, six years of coaching, so much that I learned, Man. good and bad, so much I learned that I did not know, and uh, but really grew a lot in those first six years of, of my career. If, if you could go back, and I looked it up, Coach, I think you're close to 60 years old. If you could go back and talk to the young Gene Chizik, what would you say to him? Uh, I would say this to every coach out there. Uh, and I try to live by this today. I don't have to be young to tell myself this, um, you know, two things. One, you always have to be authentic. Like Ooh. don't go out there and try to be a coach that, you know, I work for coach Ford. I'm not coach Ford. Um, <laughs> I work for Mac Brown. I work for Mac Brown right now. I don't need to try to be Mac Brown. I'm not Mac Brown and I'm never going to be Mac Brown. I just have to be me. Um, I think a lot of times people see and work for guys and, you know, they want to be this coach or that coach because he's really good and they look up to him and all those things. Um, be you. Coach the way you coach. Uh, every one of us are intrinsically different, you know, and 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 players like that. They don't want to go on a, on a coaching staff that have 15 of the same guys. Right. That's what's that's what's cool about coaching. Right. Like all the players have different personalities. Uh, the coaches have different personalities. So, number one, I would say always be authentically you. You don't got to try to be anybody else. Uh, and then the other thing is, and I mentioned it earlier, I think this really happens with a lot of people. Um, I say it to my staff now. I'd say it to all of my coaches now. Right now we are uh, in the middle of going back and looking and, and evaluating and assessing all of our self-scout from the year before. And I tell everybody, you know, you go into these with humility. Um, and what I mean by that is, I don't care how long you've been coaching. Um, you know, I've been blessed in a career and I've, I've, you know, in the world's eyes have accomplished a lot, but I can go in there and say, Hey, you know what, this is happening. And, and I don't know what the best thing is. Let's talk about it. Um, be willing to be humble enough to know that you don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. I think Socrates or somebody said, um, true wisdom is knowing that, you know, nothing. Um, and so, you have to humble yourself because you can't grow without doing that. You, you know, if you're the guy in the room, that's always going to be the smartest guy in the room. Um, you're probably the dumbest guy in the room. Because <laughs> you, you, you don't have to be that. You know what I mean? Like um, you just got to be open to learning and you got to be humble enough to, to know that to grow, I've got to open my mind up and, and open everything up to, um, you know, new things and new ideas and, all of those things. Um, I think some of the best coaches out there, some Hall of Fame guys have done great jobs over the last several years of adapting and adjusting to how things have to change. Um, well, with that becomes, you know, you got to change. And um, I think the guys that are locked in and this is the way we do it. Why? Because that's the way we've always done it. Well, why? Well, because that's the way we've always done it. Um, there might be some really great things that you've always done that way and they work, but I bet you there's some new things out there that you could tweak and add and you could learn as well. So 
I think humility is the other thing I would say for a young guy or, or me, you know what I mean? Like be humble enough to know that, you know, there's a lot of football out there and there's a lot, there's a lot of smart young football coaches. I mean, there's a lot of them out there. I mean, look at the NFL right now. They're hiring young guys. Um, some of these guys are really, really smart. And um, so, you know, don't pigeonhole yourself into something because your ego doesn't allow you to grow uh, because you've been doing it for 35 years and Fred over here has been doing it for six. Well, Fred may be doing it for six and he's a savant and he's really good. So maybe he's got some really good ideas for you to listen to. So that kind of be the two things I'd say. Yeah, it, it was great advice that your dad gave you was to listen. And when I talked to Tom McDaniels, Josh's um, dad, the head coach of the Raiders, he told his dad that Bill Belichick might be the greatest listener of all time. So there's one of the greatest coaches of all time who's also one of the greatest listeners. Who do you who have you been around, coach, that were great listeners? I think Mac Brown's a great listener. I think Mac, I mean, here's a Hall of Fame guy and people, you know, can work, you know, 40 and 50 years and never accomplish as much as he has. Um, and that's why, you know, I came back into coaching it was really because of him, to be honest with you. I was I had a nice, easy ESPN job. I was sitting pretty and um, he kind of talked me out of that. But um, I think that's one of his greatest traits that he listens Um he doesn't sit at the front of the table and act like, you know, he invented football. Mm. Uh, he's willing to listen and he's willing to, um, you know, get and receive ideas. Uh, I think he's really good at that. And I think that's one of the things that he's done over the years because I've been with him at two different places. Um, and so I think he's one of the guys that does listen. And, um, you know, uh, it, served, it certainly has served him well, uh, kind of like Bill Belichick on that next level. Um, it's it certainly served Mac well on this level. After you left Middle Tennessee, where did you go then, Coach? So um, I was kind of recruited away from Middle Tennessee um, by uh, a, a head coach. My head coach's name was John Pierce. He was an extremely successful Texas high school football coach uh, who had then become an assistant at Texas A&M. And then he took a job at a school out there in Texas called Stephen F. Austin um, out in Nacogdoches, Texas. And I had a friend of mine that was on the staff and they had a position job opening. And um, it was a really good opportunity. It was on the front end of a, uh, a new contract. Um, and, you know, it was uh, it was Texas football. It was really cool. So they kind of recruited me away from there. Um, and, and I was, I ended up going there as the linebacker coach. And then that's where I actually became a coordinator in college. Uh, so I was there a couple of years and I became the defensive coordinator there in my early thirties. Uh, and that place was amazing for me because I was there six total years. And that place was amazing because it was almost like a lab. I got to do everything I wanted to do to kind of, um, uh, experiment some, you know, I, I did a lot of learning and growing there. Um, but I, I was able to, you know, I was able to experiment. I was able to, you know, kind of work my way through some of the things that were good, some of the things that were not so good. Um, I went from being a linebacker coach. That's where my secondary background started. I had to flip when I became the coordinator, I flipped over to the secondary. So I had to learn how to coach that, which was the best move I ever made because from that point on, I was basically a secondary coach almost everywhere I went. Why do you and, think that's why do you think that's better, coach? Is it because you're responsible for giving up the big play and it's on you, or why is that? Because to me, when you when you start looking at a defense um, and you look at where most of most explosive plays are given up, they're going to be given up somewhere back there, whether it's going to be a big ball over the top whether it's going to be a missed tackle because you're the last level of the defense. Um, and I don't think as a play caller, um, at least this was true for me. When you've never coached back there and you're calling defenses, you have a little different idea. Uh, and rightly so, because you don't, you don't know what it's like to coach back there when you're calling defenses, right. You know, <laughs> you're starting with, okay, what do I got back there? Yeah. Who are my guys back there? Because my coverages and my calls 
have to play into their ability or lack of ability. Uh, maybe you're playing with a third team corner. In high school, you don't get to recruit your guys <laughs> yeah. you know, for the most part. So you get what you get. And, okay, my corner over here, not really thinking he's really what we need. So what can we do and how can we call a game to – best um you know be able to utilize that guy because we don't have a choice um but i think that what it really taught me and i think for me personally me coaching back there understanding um you know when i run a pressure um and i decide what kind of pressure that is you know everybody says let's go get them let's pressure them (laughs) i'm playing four cross man and three out of my four guys aren't great cover guys so that sounds good if you're maybe the D line guy, right? Yeah. Because you know when you look up and and the guy standing in the end zone, <laughs> all, all, all the pressure goes back there on on those guys. So um, that gave me a really really good um, comprehensive idea on where to start as a coach calling games. And so now I'm always very sensitive to that. I always start with where are we back there? How good are we back there? What can we do back there? And then I work my way up. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, everything with defense starts with the defensive line. So the better they are, um, the less, you know, violated you get as you go back. Right. Um, But sometimes you don't have guys up there either. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, so how am I how am I doing? You know, how am I calling the games? How am I game planning, you know, based on what I have back there? So I call games always um, with. You know, what is my secondary able to ham- handle um, based on the matchups that we have? Yes, sir. So if a guy's cu- calling cover zero every play, either he's got a lot of faith in his secondary or either he, like he's one of those guys that don't care. I mean, he's just it might be yeah. a mismatch. Yes. And and look, I'm, I'm not saying that there aren't circumstances where that becomes a heavy, you know, uh, si- situation for you to, you know, major in those type of things, you know, maybe it's a game where you feel like you go in and look, I, I mean, this, this, this game could get ugly. We got to do something different. We got to be yeah. on the aggressive, you know, we got to edge and hedge our bet on the aggressive side. I get all that. But at the end of the day, in general, um, when I started coaching the secondary and looking at different coverages and how to change up coverages and what things are good and what things aren't good, um, that gave me a whole new perspective when you coach those guys back there and you're responsible for those guys back there. Oh yeah. Um, it changes the game a little bit for you. So when you left, uh, Stephen F. Austin coach, where did you go after that? So then I went to the university of central Florida. Um, I was able to, uh, kind of take, I guess I was gone 10 plus years and had an opportunity to go back to the state of Florida, which, which is where I was from. And so we, uh, we, I ended up going back to UCF um, and UC Central Florida at the time had just started getting into the Division One world because they were FCS Division One AA before I got there. But by the time I got there in 1998, which is the first season I came there, um, I think we had only been a Division One program for three years. We weren't in a conference. So ultimately, we ended up scheduling everybody that as a coordinator you don't want to schedule so think about this we just moved from fcs or one double a to division one and while i was there we played auburn alabama florida georgia syracuse ole miss i mean go down the list because we weren't in a conference um and uh you know but we had guys that were fighters um you know we went into alabama and were able to beat alabama on homecoming Wow. Um, it was crazy. Beat him, at, you know, with a field goal at the very end to win it. Um, really, really, you know, played some really tough teams. Um, took Auburn down to the wire, took Georgia down to the wire. I mean, there's a lot of these games where we should have won or could have won. Uh, and we started to build our program that way. Yes, they were money games, but in the same sense, we weren't in a conference. So they had to schedule who we could play. Right. So it was I mean, it was out of every league, the Virginia Techs, the Syracuse. I mean, we were playing everybody. So um, I was there for four years as the defensive coordinator. Uh, And again, uh, just another huge part of my career in terms of growing uh, and, you know, just had a fantastic time there. Yeah, I I read about, you know, 
when you went to Central Florida, you were back in that that Tampa Bay, St. Pete area, and you would go watch the Tampa Bay Buccaneers practice and Monty Kiffin's defense and Coach Dungy. Can you talk a little bit about that, Coach? Yeah, what an amazing group of guys. Like, so they were at the top of their craft. I mean, they were as good as, you know, I mean, you think about they they had um, that's when you had the Warren <laughs> yeah. Traps and the and the and the John Lynch's and the um, Derek Brooks's. I mean, they had just Hardy Nickerson. They had some great players. And I was a young guy, and Rob Marinelli was a D line coach. He's one of the best in the world. Um, but they opened their door to me. Monty was completely gracious. I used to go sit in on um, their defensive staff meetings when they were watching practice film from OTAs. Man. And I just started hanging out and I, I, w- I wouldn't go away. And they were really, they were really gracious with their time and uh, me going over there. So it kind of became a deal where I, I could go over there. I was in Orlando and the drive was about two hours away, but I, I would, I would go over there as often as they would let me um, and just do football and just learn the kind of Tony Dungy system. And, um, you know, Monty Kiffin was the defensive coordinator at the time and, you know, they were just, they were great on defense. Um, just really, really great coaches, but more importantly, and this is a good kind of lesson for everybody uh, in terms of trying to being okay with helping young guys grow. Right. Like I was just this young guy that would just show up and they were always really cordial, really gracious. And I learned a lot and they were willing to share a lot. And, um, I've always tried to do that with young coaches now because people did that for me. Um, and so, you know, me being able to have the experience of being a defensive coordinator as the next level for myself in my career, and then having access to those guys over there that could really help me uh, was just, it was, it was awesome. And again, that was a kind of a, a four year block for me where I was really able to grow as a coach um, and just, be around really gracious people that let me come some guy they don't even know just come and hang out and uh then I got to know all those guys pretty well and they were uh they were just very gracious to me yeah it remind, your career so far reminds me of you kind of did your undergrad at Clemson you got your masters at the at the ten, well the Tennessee and then when you got to run your own deal that was when like starting your own business and you really got to learn because you were the one whose name was on it and then when you went to uh, Central Florida, you kind of got your doctorate. I mean, because it was like, I mean, I, I've never coached pro football. You got the NFL logo there behind you, coach. But, I mean, I, I know there ain't any scrubs over there. And it, they're on another level. But you also were the young, up-and-coming defensive coordinator coaching against all those big-name teams. So, you know, after that, was your name in the mix for head coaching jobs? Or where did you go after that? So after that, uh, you know, you talk about um, the schedule that we played. So (laughs) I was the defensive coordinator at Central Florida, and luckily two two years in a row we played Auburn back-to-back. Yeah. Um, In 98, we had them beat. Um, They beat us with like 17 or 30 seconds left in the game, but they beat us 10 to 6, and we played great on defense that day, and um, we really had a great performance. And then we went back there again the next year, and it was a very similar uh, type performance. Um, it got away a little bit at the end, but for the almost the entire game, it was the same thing. It was like 10 to seven, or it was a very low scoring game. So we performed well defensively. And, you know, you never know who's watching you, and you never know who's taking notes, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so the next opportunity I got was from Auburn uh, because we'd gone there and, and played well. And, um, so I became the defensive co- coordinator at Auburn uh, right after that. And so uh, my four years at Central Florida had a great four years. Loved it. I was loving life, you know, in my home state. Um, could have stayed there forever if that's what God had in plan for me. Amen. Um, but then Auburn came along. And so I ended yeah. up coming to BC there. Yeah. And I mean, so I'm pretty sure Coach Tuberville, whoever the OC was there for Auburn at the time, they're like, who is this young guy coaching this defense? And, you know, some people get caught up in always getting the next job, but they're not worried about your kids played hard. They were fundamental. You know, y'all played – you didn't beat Auburn, but y'all played them down to the wire. And that that's kind of what got your opportunity to go there. 
And then talk about, about now you're DC in the SEC. So, I mean, I mean, that's like the NFL college football at that time, coach. I mean, what was that like? Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was, it was pretty awesome. Um, you know, again, being around great coaches and, and being able to be and, and coach great players, it was, it was a blessing. Uh, but I went there in 2002. That was kind of my next progression and uh, ended up staying there for three years. Uh, my last year, and that's where Mac Brown comes into play. So my last year at Auburn, um, they had they had had to make a change on defense and they brought me in. And, you know, the first year we saw, you know, we saw improvement. The second year we saw a lot of improvement. The third year we were the number one defense in the country. Um, and we went undefeated that year. And that was the year yeah. that um, uh, that was the year that right after the season, um, Mac Brown actually reached out to me uh, about coming to Texas because he had a he had a D.C. job open. And so he kind of recruited me away from uh, Auburn. And uh, that was where our relationship started. So then I ended up leaving Auburn after three years. We won the SEC my last year. Uh, and then I ended up going to the University of Texas with Mac. Um, and, uh, you know, in our first year there, we won the Big 12 and won the national championship. So uh, there's not a lot of places you can go uh, from Auburn as the D.C. Um, that you would consider, a, a, you know, a yeah. step up. But um, uh, we had a very, very talented team at Texas and we had a really great quarterback and Max a great recruit. So I ended up leaving Auburn and, and going with him. And, you know, it ended up being a great two year stint at Texas as well. In, in the national championship game that y'all played, you know, when Vince Young, I mean, I don't want to say Vince Young won the game, but I mean, that was one of my favorite games, coach. I mean, that went, I was watching it and it was late at night on the East Coast. And I mean, it, it was just a wonderful football game, man. I mean, y'all beat USC, correct? I mean, that was at their height. Yeah, Troy, it was pretty amazing. Like sometimes there'll be a replay on it late at night and I'll, it'll be 11 o'clock and it'll come on on one of those 30 for 30s or, you know, the, one of those deals where they're, they're playing the game again. And, you know, the game is such a blur when you're in the middle of it. Um, but I'll go back and it's it's really fun to watch as a spectator. I'll go yeah. back and go, golly, I forgot that happened. Oh, wow, that uh, that's crazy that that happened. But, I mean, you'd have to look back on that game and and feel like, it's probably one of the top national championship games of all time. Um, and I was blessed to be a part of it. It was a great team and just great guys. And uh, obviously winning national championships are, are extremely difficult to do. And I was, I was glad to be a part of that one. Yes, sir. So you, after that, you get to be uh, head coach, correct? I mean, you, you're the young DC y'all coming off a national championship. Is it the next year that you get hired as, to be the head coach? And it was. Iowa State. Uh, it was. Uh, I got an opportunity to be a head coach at Iowa State, um, and um, Jamie Pollard was the AD there, and he's the one that hired me. And uh, you know, I went to Iowa State with the idea to stay there a long time and build it. You know, you had mentioned it earlier. Um, I never went to a place right now to say what's my next step. Mm -hmm. I was always where my feet were. Uh, never worried about. Am I going to get a head coaching job or am I going to get a better job? Am I going to, I always just felt like if you go where you're at, I was never a guy to pick up the phone. Matter of fact, I can say in my entire career, I'm not sure that a, I've ever called on a job. Not one time. Yeah. I have guys text me all the time. Like Troy, do you know so-and-so at VMI? Or do you know so -and -so? I'm like, man, if you got to come to me to get a job, like you ain't going to get it. You know? Right. Right. And, and so, um, you know, I always just was a believer that you do, you do your job wherever you're at. You grind. Your resume you is your work. Better. Your resume. It is, it is. Um, and that, that worked for me. Um, that's, that's the way I was brought up. That's the way my dad raised me. Um, you know, don't, don't be looking, you know, over the mountain for the next thing. Um, mm -hmm. just do, do what you're supposed to do. And so, um, Iowa State gave me the opportunity to be a head coach there. I planned on being there for a long time. It was a huge rebuilding project um, in terms of talent, in terms of facilities, in terms of a lot of things, but I thought it was really a challenge. I thought it was a really a great challenge. And, you know, people a lot of times say, you know, why did you take that job? You could have waited and got X, Y, and Z job. 
Um, but I was ready. I was ready from a leadership standpoint. I was ready um, from a leadership role. Uh, I was ready to build something that I thought was really tough. I had previously in the previous three or four years, we'd won a lot of football games. I wasn't really a part of a lot of losses. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I thought this was a great challenge. I thought I thought this is this is the one that I can take and build it. And uh, it was challenging uh, for me. And so I ended up taking that for two years. Um, and that's when Auburn came and uh, pulled me out of Ames, Iowa, and got me back to a place that I was there previous. And my children loved it. Um, I, you know, I had a great experience there. And when that, that job came open, Auburn came, and I ended up going back to Auburn as the head coach. Coach, um, let me ask you about your time at Iowa State. Brad Stevens, who, you know, he's the head coach of the Celtics and was the longtime basketball coach at Butler, he talked about when he went to the NBA, he had to get used to losing because, I mean, in the NBA, you don't win every week. So how did you handle that, Coach, going from never losing a game, winning the national championship, to taking over a program – and you might not have won the amount of games that you wanted to. What kept you motivated or grounded? Or, I mean, you, you went from there to the head coach at Auburn. Because some people are like, oh, I, I got to win this number of games or I'm not going to get the next job. But talk a little bit about that, Coach. Yeah, that's a great question, Troy, because um, losing is hard. And, you know, but you ask how we, you know, how we endured that. Um, I thought it was a challenge for us every day on our approach with these young guys, right? Um, one thing that I was always adamant about is that whether we're winning or we're losing, that they get the same guy. Mm -hmm. I've always I've always been very uh, adamant about that, right? Don't uh, let me walk in the building one day as the head coach and because the circumstances are this way, this is how I am. Oh, the circumstances have changed. Well, let me change with that. I just didn't really, you know, I call that the chameleon approach, right? Like I'm going to be what, you know, I'm going to be what the circumstances dictate. I'm going to change colors based on, you know, what's happening in my, in my life, in my world. And I never believed in that. So um, it was challenging for sure. Cause nobody likes losing. Uh, but we were, you know, we were in a position where we were um, trying to change the culture um, there was a lot of games where we were in it right down to the end and should have won it. And talent wise, the disparity was huge. Uh, the first game I ever won as a head coach was a huge rivalry game against Iowa. And yeah. they probably, had, big one. they probably had 10 F NFL guys on their roster. And, you know, it was my first home game ever against them. It was like the third game of the year. Uh, and we beat Iowa. And so that was a huge win. Huge. There's some other games in there. Um, Oh, in that journey where we were, we were right down to the wire. But again, you got to teach people how to win. You got to teach them, you know, that there's the, all the little things that go into winning, right? There's a, there's that fine line in there and we all experience it no matter how long we've been coaching, but there's a fine line in there. And how do we get over that hump when we're that close? And we were learning to do that. And, but in the meantime, it was a great lesson for me as a leader, um, particularly in my first head coaching job, is yeah. hand, how to handle the room when things aren't good. Mm. Uh, and that's that's a sometimes can that can be a heavy task. Um, but you got to check yourself every day uh, and you got to make sure. Humility. You, yeah. Yeah. And you, you check and you stand in front of those guys and you make sure that they know this is who I am today. Whether we win tomorrow, whether we lose tomorrow, this is the guy. This is the same guy tomorrow. Um, that's who I'm going to be. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't urgency. That doesn't mean that, you know, things aren't an emergency. Um, it just means that no matter what's happening, my circumstances won't dictate who I am uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's kind of how we approached it with our entire staff. And I told all of our guys, don't go into your meeting room when your position played bad and treat them any differently than you would when you played good. Mm -hmm. if you're if you're a hard nosed dude and that's how you coach and blah, blah, blah. then that's how you coach. Right. Yeah. Guys have different styles. Make sure your style doesn't change. I'm not saying there's not urgency. I'm not saying that, you know, we don't go in there with a huge, um, you know, uh, message to these guys that everything we do is urgent all the time. 
Um, but don't let them see you be different than you were um, before the season started. That's really, really challenging for guys. It's hard because it can wear on you. Um, but it was a, a lot of huge lessons I learned in that. Yeah. So you go to Auburn. I mean, and Coach Saban, I've heard him say, like, your whole life you're trying to get up the mountain and then you become the mountain. So you, you have the mountain of Saban. I mean, I, I've never coached at Auburn or Alabama or even in the state of Alabama. But if you get hired as the head coach at Auburn, you know you got to beat Nick Saban. And you hire Gus Malzahn as your offensive coordinator. And I don't know why, but it seems like high school coaches, and I didn't even know you were a high school coach, but high school coaches seem like they have the best record against Coach Saban. I don't know why. Maybe it's the unorthodox style of offense or the fast pace uh, before he really changed what he was doing. But, I mean, talk about that, Coach. I mean, I mean, your rival is – you know, the GOAT, and you've got to go in there and you win a national championship. Yeah, um, Coach Saban <laughs> is the best of all time. I mean, there's there's no question about it. With, with what he's accomplished, um, doing it in, at an incredibly high level for this long, uh, and losing coaches every single year. I don't think people realize how, how tough that is. That, that's, a hard, that's a hard gig, right? And he's been able to just be, I mean, you know, across the board every year in the conversation of national championships, which is amazing. Um, but, yeah, when you're at Auburn, you're expected to, you know, you're, you're expected to beat Alabama. And it doesn't matter who your players are or who their players are. That's just the expectation. That's why there's been three coaches since I got fired. So Man. that's the way it goes. Right. So, um but it was uh, it was challenging, uh, you know, our first year playing in the Iron Bowl, which the Iron Bowl is an incredible. I've been in seven of them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I don't even want to describe it because I would probably cheapen the way it really is. It's, yeah, Coach, I, I've had Maslin, I had Coach Tom McDaniels, Maslin versus McKinley. I've had in Virginia, Bluefield versus Graham, Coach Mars. And now I, I had you, Coach, you coach in the uh, the, the Iron Bowl. So, I mean, I don't think there are three bigger rivalries. Those are huge. Yeah, those are the, the first two you said are there. They are huge. Um, and the Iron Bowl is an incredible game. It's what college football is all about. But we were able to go in there the first year. And, boy, we had – I mean, no one gave us a shot. Alabama was number one in the country, I think, at the time, maybe number two. Um, I think they probably were undefeated. If not, maybe they had lost the game. I think we limped into the game. We just got beat by Georgia uh, kind of at the end of the game. And we were probably seven and four, seven and three going into the game or seven and four. Maybe I can't remember, but we, uh, we were really aggressive and, and we got after Alabama pretty good and they had to score with a minute left to beat us. That was my first iron bowl as a head coach. And then the next year, um, you know, we went to Tuscaloosa and got down 24, nothing. Um, and we were on a national championship run at that point. They had already lost the game, um, and we'd already clinched the, the the West. And we went in there, and it, the score was twenty four nothing quick. And that's not a good position to be in in the Iron Bowl. Let me tell you. So, man, um, man. we were able to flip that and uh, get that game flipped back, and we ended up winning it. But uh, coaching against him was an honor. And uh, man, I you're a, a true competitor. Of, you're a true yeah. competitor, coach. Yeah, he's a, he's he's an amazing coach, and um, he's definitely – he's got this whole thing figured out for sure. I mean, focus on the process, not the outcome. You know, and I guess, you know, sometimes after games, he he's not too happy with the process when it doesn't go his way. But, I mean, it, really at Iowa State, that's what you had to do was focus on the process, Coach, and not the outcome. And, you know, how many years did it take you to win a national championship? Well, um, as a head coach, uh, it was my fourth year. It was my second year at Auburn, but my fourth Man. year. And um, I learned a lot, but I had a lot of great players. And when you have Cam Newton at quarterback, it certainly gives you a better chance, right? Game um, changer. Game yeah, changer. It's a huge game changer. human. Huge human. Yeah. He's a big personality and a big player. So, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I've been blessed to be in some good spots and be with a lot of good coaches at. Um, you know, we are on the same page and everybody was aligned um, and a lot of players that were just amazing young men, man. I love them to this day. And um, we, we just had our 10 year reunion last year because we wanted to do it before. But COVID hit 
uh, and just so many of those guys that are so appreciative of that time, that period of time in their life as players, um, just like we were, like, as we look back on it, just like we are as coaches. And I think the, the thing is, is I think championship, the word championship gets thrown around all the time because everyone expects them. And I don't think people realize what goes into those and how hard those are truly to, to come by. You know, we look at the Super Bowl and we see the confetti coming down and we look at the national championship and everybody's like, man, that's really cool, man. I, I, I'd love to be that. And then, you know, every year uh, there's 35 or 40 schools that really feel like their school should win the national championship. And that's great, but they're hard <laughs> to come by. They are really, really hard to come by. And the things that happen have to happen be behind the scenes uh, with players and coaches, uh, they're, they're tough journeys, man. So I got so much respect for all these guys that are being able to win them, Kirby, Nick, um, just the guys that that win them because I know what Mac and I know what go behind those and it's it's a lot of work. Yes, sir. Uh, so you, you go into ESPN. I just want to ask you a little bit about that, Coach. What was that like coming off the field after having such a, a long career and you had an opportunity to visit? You know, Coach Urban Meyer and Coach Gruden talk about they were able to visit a lot of different places. Was there anybody that you visited that you were like, wow, like? They surprise you like that guy, his program is legit or something you took from somebody. I mean, I, I yeah, I ended up visiting a lot of different people, um, some NFL, some college. Um, you know, the bigger picture is not really necessarily if there was somebody that just jumped out because everybody did cool things. Um, but what was really interesting was how many different ways there are to do things and still have a lot of success that are completely polar opposites from everybody. So, you know, in coaching, a lot of times we get this idea that there's this one way to do it. Um, and it's, it's really cool when you go visit a Georgia uh, or you go visit an Alabama or you go visit uh, a TCU uh, or a Texas A&M or whoever, um, a lot of different ways to do it and get it done completely different than the other group uh and you know but it's all about philosophies it's all about alignment it's all about everybody being on the same page it's all about messaging uh and it's all about means to the madness on how to work your team and there's no science for that um teams are different every year but it's just you know watching coaches how they work their teams based on what they know their teams need um some guys have a very um uh, I guess, uh, older team. Uh, some guys have younger teams. Some guys, when you have the younger teams, feel like you got to do certain things with them different than you have an older team. Uh, and so, but it was really interesting, more so sitting down with the guys. I mean, you know, I went and visited Kentucky one time and Mark Stoops had just come off nine or 10 wins. Yeah. Um, and it was an amazing coaching job. I mean, it was amazing. Um, and, uh, he looked worn out. He said, he said, Gene, I'm tired, man. Like I'm, I'm tired. Uh, but you know, the way they built it, the way they did it, um, the way they approached everything, uh, watching them practice, just, you know, guys like that, that, you know, have done more with less. I mean, honestly, you know, and, and, um, and, and building those programs where now that it's sustainable and they're getting great players and their facilities have changed and all that. So that was really kind of, my takeaway in ESPN when I would go visit people, uh, just how different people are and they still have, you know, they still have a lot of success. Did you actually do the color commentating during the game or are you just behind the desk coach? So um, I would do both. Uh, okay. I would, be, I would be in the booth. Um, so sometimes I do Thursday night games. Sometimes I do Friday night games. I never did Saturday night games because on the weekends I was always in studio. So um, I did that. I did it for six years, actually. I remember um, the Thursday night games you used to do. Yeah. So I used to do Thursday night games. Uh, and then I would just fly into the studio the next day and do studio during the weekends. But um, it was a mixture of both. So I got to actually go and visit with the coaches. And it was very bizarre when I first started doing that <laughs> because I was on the other side of that. Right. And um, so now you flip it and, you know, uh, I've done, you know, games and, you know, with uh, Dave Clawson, you know, when he was first the head coach of Wake Forest and 
you know, I did games with Mark Rick when he was a head coach at Miami and just, you know, it was just interesting um, being on that side of it. Uh, and then I really enjoyed studio. Studio was really. Uh, why did you, really why did you enjoy the studio? Was it, did you enjoy, enjoy it more than the actual in game? Um, I, I would say I, I, I really liked them about the same. Uh, the game was awesome because you want to be around the environment. You love the environment. You love the game. You love the game itself. Um, calling it like you see it. Um, and really from a football perspective, um, you know, you're just kind of talking out loud about what you see. No different than you be sitting in your living room uh, talking with your best buddy as you're watching the game, right? And that was kind of that. And then TV, um, I like doing studio because um, I felt like I could break things down for the viewer, uh, make it simple. Um, and uh, also, um, you know, I want to give people a realistic look at what it's like to be a coach from a coaching perspective. Mm. You know, uh, I wasn't on this bandwagon of, you know, coach so-and-so just lost four games. Let's fire him. I would give people the, the look. Let me tell you what's really going on behind the scenes that we don't know all these yeah. things, you know, everybody's jump quick to jump and pull the trigger because all the social media, but what's really happening with coach Smith or coach Jones, right? You know, so I always tried to balance out the perspective for people so they could get a realistic picture instead of what the fans always think, right? You know, what, the, what the fans say you ought to do and what, you know, fans are called fans because it's short for fanatics. Okay? Yeah. And that's why they're fans. So, you know, I always try to give a different perspective. And so I like doing the uh, I like doing the Saturday night in studio stuff, recapping games. Yes, sir. I mean, I guess in the in sports commentator world, you, you have your, you know, your Stephen A. Smith, your guys. I mean, they played ball, but they weren't on your level of a coach or a player. So they're kind of like the fanatics. But you represented the coach's perspective and you took up for the coaches because there's so many guys that would probably say, you know, that coach needs to be fired. But as, as being a, a coach, you never really were a media guy. You're just um, a coach. When you do color commentating coach, what, what advice did they give you? Is it just think out loud? Like you said, no, uh, ESPN was really uh, interesting because, you know, they, they wanted you to give your perspective. They didn't tell you, um, exactly what you ought to think, or, you know, they just wanted you to be authentic and they wanted you to say what you, you know, think needs to be said at that moment. And, you know, they always are in favor of you giving a point of view that most people wouldn't think about or see. Mm. Um, and they were good with that. And, you know, you do a lot of uh, studio stuff or you do a lot of games uh, at some, at some points with former players and even former great players don't see it like you see it as a coach. They don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so there would be a lot of those conversations as well, you know, because, you know, sometimes former players can gravitate towards that same message. We'll just fire him right now. He, no, hang on, dude. Like you, you, you haven't coached. Let's go back and let's look. So, you know, these, these guys have lost, you know, four games by a total of, you know, nine points and they get, you know, they had, you know, these injuries and that injury or whatever, you know, they're just, there's always things out there. Um, and, you know, I mean, look, Brian Kelly at Notre Dame one year went four and eight. They didn't fire him. The next year he won 10. Hmm. Gary Patterson, same thing. One year I think went three and nine. They didn't fire him. The next year he won 10. You know, so they have all this quick trigger, you know, idea on people all the time instead of letting them play through it um, because there's no knee jerk reactions. Uh, and then all of a sudden they turn around and they realize, oh, keeping him was a good idea yeah. because just cutting the head off of it right now uh, just automatically isn't always the answer. And I'm not saying that that's not sometimes what you need to do. Obviously you get that right. There's things going on in the program that people don't see or know. Um, and you know, there's, there's stuff going on behind the scenes that aren't good and you have to make a change. Uh, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes behind the scenes, it's going really good. Sometimes, you know, they're just, you know, a hair away from and there's circumstantial things, um, you know, that, you know, you, they're out of their control. So you can't tell me Brian Kelly's a bad coach. He's a good coach at LSU. Yeah, he but won he went, everywhere he went. He went four and eight. 
maybe there's some changes he had to make, you know, some things of that nature. So um, kudos to the guys that don't knee jerk react uh, and just, you know, say, let's cut the head off of it and let's go in another direction. Cause unfortunately that's what's happening over and over in college football because the amount of money that's being, you know, paid to guys, but that doesn't necessarily do things right for the kids in the building that get done with their college career. Um, we got a guy that transferred into us right now, and this is his sixth year of playing football, and he's had six position coaches. So that's tough. That's hard on kids, right? So that's not always oh, yeah. So um, I was always uh, really good with being okay with giving that perspective. Yes, sir. Well, Coach, you've spent over an hour with me, and I really appreciate it, Coach. And I know you're a busy man. But it means the world to me. It, it means the world to the coaches in Virginia and North Carolina um, that are watching and all around the country. You know, being the son of a high school coach and coaching high school ball, what, what would you like to leave the clinic with for those guys, Coach? Well, I want to tell you this. I have so much respect for, for high school coaches. Um, you're not doing it for the money. Um, hopefully you're doing it for impact. Um, it's an amazing, amazing um, profession. And the impact that you have on young guys is unbelievable. They will remember you more than they remember anybody that is a non-family member. Hmm. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent, that's on you. What are they going to remember uh, about you? Uh, what are they going to remember about your leadership? Uh, what are they going to remember about you when, when things weren't going good? What are they going to learn about you um, in terms of you caring for that young guy? And, and, you know, what kind of impact are you going to ultimately have on him um, with his family and his kids? Because your impact is definitely generational. Don't think it's not because mm. something that you say and do and the way you treat them for three or four years or however long you're around them will have impact. It has to. And it's one way or the other but I've got so much respect for um, high school coaches because, you know, that's what the majority of you guys do it for. You know what I mean? You do it for impact. You do it because you love the game. You learn because you can teach them so many things that they can't learn anywhere else. And sometimes on a day in day out basis, it's hard to remember that, but just remember that that's what yeah. you're doing it. That's, that's what you're doing it for and never forget the generational impact you can have on these guys for the better. That would be that would be what I would that would be my parting uh, my parting uh, thought. Yes, sir. Well, I appreciate the time. Rat Coach, our sponsor. Uh, thank you for supporting us and Coach Chiswick. I'll be down there to uh, watch y'all spring ball. Looking forward um, to seeing you and Coach Brown um, and Coach Lindsey and everything y'all are doing. And just thank you, Coach. Thank you for coming on today. God bless you. Thank you, Troy. I appreciate it, my man. And I hope. Uh, Hope everybody has a great, safe weekend, and I hope everybody can get something out of all these. You guys do a great job, and we appreciate, appreciate you, Coach. Guys. Thank you.